service. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So my name is Wayne Kuna. I serve uh, with my wife in the uh, Kingdom Kids. We uh, teach once a month or something like that, and we get to learn a lot from your children. So uh, it's a good thing. I also love serving the Lord here as one of your elders. So uh, thanks for letting me be that. You can find information about uh, Grace Bible Church at our website, which is gbcelm.org or on any of the social media platforms, at GBC Elm. Oh, I forgot to bring up a baby bottle. But how are they coming? Singing pretty good? Now, if you run out of change, use dollar bills. If you run out of dollar bills, use checks. If you run out of checks, go online and just use your credit card, a carrying network. Uh, and by the way, contrary to uh, some pro-choice propaganda, this isn't simply about saving a baby. It's about walking with a woman through her whole experience and actually spending time with them, maybe years with them. So it is really an all-in ministry. I also want to thank all of you who contributed to the Noyon Church Stage Remodel Fund, Noyon, France. Uh, where are the keels? There they are. Help start the church. God used them to help do that, and Margaret, and they're carrying on well without them. Uh, all your contributions were used to purchase the materials needed to, and the volunteers set up to remodel the stage and take it away. We are going to France. There is a remote stairs. I'm not so sure about the carpet. So you can see some of the uh, work that has been done in Noyon to set up their new stage. And uh, all of it uh, has been put together by them but with uh, your help. Thank you very much. Now, I also, we also have today one of our Life on Mission moments, and today I'd like to invite one of my wife's BFFs. So, um, Bree, would you come up here, Bree Evans, to give us a little bit about what your... Oh, no. Ta-da! Yeah, I know. Make it one of those entrances. Yay, Bree, come on up. Sorry, I am coughing a lot, and I don't have COVID, but I'm very stuffy. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. <laughs> um, I am really excited to tell you about. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm excited to tell you about an opportunity that I have um, to serve in a ministry in Central Asia. Um, it's called Caring Heart, and I'd love to tell you a little bit about it. Um, there's. Show you some details. Um, so first of all, it is going to be in Taraz, Kazakhstan. Um, and I guess if you can show the map, here's a map of it. Taraz is way down um, on the border of Kyrgyzstan. And you may be wondering why Kazakhstan. Um, I actually um, was supposed to go to Kazakhstan for my internship. Um, for Moody Bible Institute a few years ago, but COVID came and I wasn't able to go. Um, but then it wasn't to this ministry, but I, um, my former pastor actually has connections there, and um, I got to talk to one of the founders um, of Caring Heart, and she helped me out with a paper that I was writing for school on time. So that's how I got connected to this ministry. Um, so now a little bit about the ministry, um, Caring Heart. Um, they run a home, which is called um, J127 Ranch. Uh, this actually stands for James 127, and uh, which says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So this directly pertains to what they do as a ministry. Um, my role will be to volunteer and this ministry, which provides uh, daycare, a home for children who need it, and 
um, employment training for the mothers of the children. Um, they currently have 21 children living there, um, and they live there five days a week. They go home on the weekends to their parents, um, but it's usually like really rough situations, so um, that's why they have this home for them. Um, they have 75 kids in their daycare, so a total of 100 children that they are serving. Um, my role will be to help out with whatever they need, um, or wherever my gifts and abilities really fit. Um, to help them. Um, I can, I'll be doing like ESL teaching. Um, I've been doing baking at Moody Bible Institute for the last year, so I can help with that. Um, children's activities, and honestly, if I can just hold a baby <laughs> every day, I will be happy. <laughs> um, so, first slide for, this is a picture. Um, there's Beth and Victoria. They're up there in each one of those. They are the uh, two Christian women from America who founded this ministry. Um, They've been there for like, I don't know, 20 years. Um, and then for slide two, um, so when this will be, I'm planning, hoping to leave at the end of August, um, maybe the, the beginning of September and um, re returning before December. Um, uh, this will be about three to five months, but there are a lot of details that are still in the works, including a trip to Kyrgyzstan maybe for one or two months. Um, so that's why I'm not sure if it's three or five months. Um, but yeah, then uh, for the next slide, how you can be involved. Um, I would really love it if you all could be involved with me in this. Uh, first, please pray for me. Um, so actually, the visa thing is not, I don't, it's already an answered prayer. I don't have to actually apply for a visa, so that's not um, a need. I could just go for 90 days. Um, but please be praying for the um finances of the trip. I do have to raise money. Um, so if you'd be praying for that and then that God would just prepare my heart that I would be have the right like heart set mindset and um, just be ready to serve however they need me. Um, and then there is the war in Ukraine as you all know. Um, and Russia is actually the only thing that separates them from Ukraine. Um, so they have been affected a little bit um, by like prices rising and shortages occurring but so far it's been Okay, but yeah, just keep praying for that. Um, um, and then that God would just continue to open doors and um, that everything would go smoothly um, as I'm planning all this. Um, and then lastly, um, oh, second, partner with me. Um, just keep in touch. I would love to, like, share what's going on while I'm there and, um, yeah, just let you know what I'm doing and how you can be praying for that. I'm still figuring out a prayer letter. Um, if I'm able to send those out while I'm there, uh, but yeah, that would, um, if you could just text me occasionally, I would love that. Um, and then lastly, um, consider financially supporting me. The cost of the trip is around $4,000. Um, that's an estimate. Um, but yeah, that will cover housing, which I'll probably be in a host home. I'm not really sure yet. And just living expenses. So yeah, um, it is an honor to be able to share this all with you. It's kind of crazy that I'm up here and actually presenting it to you. I've been thinking about it and planning for it for a very long time. Um, thank you so much for listening to me. And uh, for those of you who have supported me in the past, I really appreciate that. Um, if you have any questions at all about this trip, please feel free to find me afterwards uh, and just ask me, and I would love to share more about it. Um, thank you. Thanks, Bree. So she talked about the visa, but you could use your visa, all right, online. All you have to do is uh, hit the little short-term missions experience selection button and uh, give an amount that you want to, or you could actually write a check and just put that same wording, short-term missions experiences, in the notes section. So thanks a lot, Bree. And then as we move to prayer and worship, remember the worship uh, with your time, talents, and treasures. Your financial gifts here really fund the ongoing local and global ministry of this church. The gospel is free. Ministry isn't. Okay? So join me in prayer. Lord, um, you reign on high in majesty and splendor. You are, as you reveal to us, Jehovah Rohai, the Lord our shepherd, Jehovah Nisi, 
the Lord our banner, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of angel armies, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord of peace, Jehovah Shama, the Lord is present, and Jehovah Sikenu, the Lord our righteousness. But you say, don't call me that. You tell us, refer to me as Abba. Call me Daddy. Call me Father. And we, by faith, who have received your Son as our Savior and the forgiveness that you have given us through him and our eternal life, we thank you for him. So, Father, please hear our prayer, the prayer of your children. Lord, we do pray for Bree. We ask, Lord God, that you would go before her, that you would be behind her, to the left of her, to the right of her, above her, below her, that you would bring your power around her, your glory around her, so that you could accomplish your work through her, not only there uh, in Kurdistan, but also here as she prepares the path. Lord God, we also want to pray and for your blessing on our sister church's pathway community as they're looking for a new pastor. We also want to pray for West Suburban community as they look to unite and to grow. We also pray for City View, Lord, uh, Community Church, as they've taken up the bold step to renovate their building. And Lord, we also want to pray for Pastor Kyle's wife, Jackie, as she waits to have a, a time scheduled for her heart surgery, Lord God. Father, we just ask your prayer for this. And we want to thank you, Lord God, for using us in Noyon at the church there with this church, the stage remodel. Lord, your, your prophet Habakkuk prayed, how long must we cry out violence? We witness injustice every day. The wicked intimidate and strike down the innocent. Lord, that's what Habakkuk said. Please, Lord God, hear our prayer. Heal America's culture of violence. Heal our vitriol. Heal the destructive patterns that we have. Please bring your healing light to dispel the darkness from our land and sow seeds of justice and mercy and humility. Lord, we ask specifically to make our country uh, love and respect life again. And make your church in America people who love with all of your love, all the people from first heartbeat to last. Father, we continue to ask that you stop the horrors of the war being perpetrated on the people in the Ukraine. We thank you for nations like Poland who have shown mercy to those fleeing destruction. We ask that you embolden and inspire your church to paint living masterpieces of Jesus Christ on their hearts, souls, and minds of those fleeing to safety. For our time here together this morning, Lord, we humbly pray that the Spirit flood us with power to elevate our eyes, thoughts, affections, and desires off of this world and onto the heavenly, where we abide in Christ, who sits in power at your right hand. Father, may that vision inspire Pastor Adam to speak, inspire us to hear, and transform us into Christ's witnesses of his forgiveness, healing, and hope to those around us and to those around the world. And we all said together, amen. You guys want to stand? Fear the 
so I may see that you have made these ways for me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you, my God, will walk with me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you have made these ways for me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you, my God, will walk with me. And the one peace that I have found wherever I may be. For all my ways are known to
Can we start over? <laughs> I'm really sorry. Let's let's try again. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. If you're five through fourth grade, you can scamper off to Kingdom Kids Celebrate. Parents, you can pick them up in a room over there that starts with the number two. I don't know all of the other numbers. 232. And then Adam can come up and. Good morning. Steph, I felt for you. I was hearing a totally different tune in my head. And every time we got to it, I was off singing some other song. I don't know. Well, that's life. You know, it's always a sour note, always some disharmony. That's why we look to heaven, where we're all singing perfect time. 
You know, it's interesting when you watch the news, when you listen to people talk, we're obsessed with identity in this country, everything. I mean, we actually have a term for it, identity politics. It's you vote based on who you are, and who you are really is predicated upon whoever you want to be. It sounds a whole lot like what we have heard and read in the book of Judges, how everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and as a result, God sent consequences. He allowed the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the Eastern people to invade uh, the nation of Israel, a nation that God had promised to protect, provided they obeyed God and the covenant that he made with them at Sinai. Today, here in the United States and really all over the world, we are suffering from uh, the consequences of going our own way, of deciding who we are and who we will choose to be, and out of that, then, therefore, who we will act like, how we will act. There's so much that we allow to impact our sense of identity. I mean, we're bombarded with labels, ideals. This is the way you should live. Expectations. I expected more. You're a certain type of person. Today, we're sort of in the middle of the woke movement where if you don't believe a certain set of principles, automatically, regardless of the underlying reason, the foundations, you're rejected as being a bad person. There's never any nuance to the argument. There's never any discussion about, well, I believe some of this and not some of this. It's an entire body of knowledge. A doctrine is really what it is. And if you don't believe all of it or any of it, then you're rejected. I mean, we are stuck in a place where there are competing voices telling us who we should be and how to squeeze us into a particular mold. And in doing so, we often fall prey to it, even those who've walked with the Lord for a long time, even those of us who have read the Scripture, see what God's will is for our lives. It's so subtle. Satan's so subtle that we begin to act in ways that are not truly who we are. We begin to think in manner that is a way that is not truly us. We all succumb in some way or another. We wear masks. We we live out of a false self. But God knows the real you better than you know the real you. I don't know about you, but there are times in my life where God has told me, either from his word or from an inward voice, saying, I should turn right and not left. And I say, that makes no sense. This is how you built me. This is how I am. I was made for going left. And I would go left and suffer the consequences and looking after, in hindsight, that I should have went right. Because God knew what I really wanted. God knew me better than I knew me, just as he knows you better than you know you. After all, he made us. You were made with a purpose. You were created to serve that purpose. In Ephesians, it says that we are his workmanship, that we're his masterpiece, that he's created, that we should walk in the way that he's created us, that we should be living the way that we were created. But when we live in disharmony from whom God created us to be, we suffer the consequences. I mean, think about it. When we live out of a false self and we don't act out of who God says we are, we lose joy. We seek things, our joy and our comfort, everywhere but God. We end up reaping the consequences of that. When we live out of our false self, we sometimes, I think this is a really common one, guys, especially in a church, GBC for many years and still in a lot of ways, we're very safe. Now, if you're saying, yeah, that's great, there's nothing wrong with that, I'm talking to you right now, okay? When we live out of a false self, instead of trusting the Lord to live into who he's called us to be, we play it safe and do not achieve the things God is asking us to achieve. We never step out in faith and take that risk because it's God who's in us and tells us that we can do it. Instead, we look at our surroundings, the what-ifs, the landmines out there, and we don't act. We settle for less. On the other hand, if we live out of a false self, we just go running and doing whatever we think we feel like. Whatever God has said, we go. And we run so hard, we end up self-destructing. We look for things that will seek to make us happy, happy, but they never do. But perhaps the most dangerous thing is that when we live out of a false self, we participate in the delusion of this world. Now, I use that word delusion intentionally. It's a very strong word. I think that when we live apart from what God has said, after after all, God's word is truth, we participate in a delusion. We live out of untruths. In fact, our whole world is full of them. 
Watch some commercials for a while and see what the world is asking you to value. Listen to the news for just a moment. And we'll see how people are asking you to fear and to trust in something other than God and God alone. We participate in the delusion. Last week we discussed how Israel rejected the one true God and there were consequences for that. The invasion of the Midianites and the consumption of God's blessings. Their disobedience led to consequences. Now today we're moving beyond the sort of societal setting that we saw last week to a specific person. The man Gideon. Today we will see that our identity is not in who we think we are or who society tells us that we should be, but in who God declares us to be already. So if you'll turn with me, this is Judges chapter 6, verse 11. I think we go through 22 or something like that, but we're starting at 11. Chapter 6, verse 11. This is what it says. If you watch up here, it's easy and lazy, but if you actually have your Bible, you should open it up and follow along. All right? 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now, if we look at just this first verse, there's a lot of background information that is important to understanding what it is we're going to learn today. The first are the people, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is a character that we see again and again in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord, I was trying to think of like, what is the most obvious... He's God's alter ego. He's God's alter ego. Think of Superman, okay? You have Superman and you have Clark Kent. When God appears on earth, he appears in a different form. This is called the angel of the Lord or the messenger of the Lord. But it is really Yahweh himself, God himself present on earth in the form of a messenger. We see this through lots of passages in the Old Testament where the term Yahweh is conflated with the angel. So someone will be speaking to the angel. We'll see it here a little bit in the text. Someone will be speaking to the angel, and the angel will be speaking as the messenger of God, and suddenly the person is addressing this angel as God himself. This is called a theophany. This is appearance of God on earth. So the angel of the Lord. So this is God himself when we read the rest of this account, speaking to Gideon. We read of Joash, this is Gideon's father, the Abiezrite, from the family or the tribe of Abiezer. And finally, Gideon, the, the sort of subject of our study over the next 12 remaining weeks. If we look at where he is, it's really interesting. It says that he's at his father's oak in Ophrah. Now, this word oak is interesting because it's not the typical word for tree. Eitz is the Hebrew word for tree. This is the word elah. This is the term sometimes translated as terebin. This word is important because it's not just some tree. This is the place where pagans worship their gods. This is the place where Canaanites worship the god of Ashtra and Baal and all of the other gods of that area. They were uh, polytheists. And so this is his father's tree. His family are pagans. His family is worshiping, and probably Gideon too, for he certainly doesn't know the Lord uh, as one who has been following him, as one who has been trusting him. Interestingly enough, the words for uh, oak and pistachio in Hebrew are elion, oak, and ela, pistachio, or terebinth, and they're related to the word god and goddess. We see this coming through after all the years. There's still Canaanite influence in the nation of Israel today, thousands and thousands of years later in the way that they speak. Perhaps the most important piece here is what Gideon is doing. Gideon Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. All right, now to give you an idea of what that means, imagine that the rest of the land on a farm or in a little farmette is like the level of the carpet down here. But up here is an elevated plateau, and it was stone. And this was the threshing floor. What would happen is they would grow their crops, wheat or whatever other grain, and then once it dried, they would take it down and sickle it from the, the ground. And they would bring all of the unopened heads of wheat onto the threshing floor. And they would lay it in a pile, and they would beat the devil out of it. They'd have forks, they'd have boards, they would beat it over and over again. And with the forks, they would go under it and flip it up in the air. And all of that sort of skin, the husk that comes off of the head of the grain, gets blown away by the wind. And the hard kernel, the part that is eaten, falls to the ground until pretty soon there's a higher concentration of those, and they're able to take them, pick the last little bits out, and grind them to use them as flour. So you can imagine that a threshing floor has to be exposed to the wind, so it's often elevated. Okay, But Gideon, 
is threshing his wheat in a wine press, which is exactly the opposite. It's a depression in stone hidden down below so no one can see. It says he's hiding it from the Midianites. So he's hiding the little bit of wheat that's left, the little bit of grain from those who had invaded. With that in mind, this is what the angel of the Lord says to Gideon. 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Hardly a mighty warrior. There's such a dissonance here between what Gideon is doing and how Gideon is behaving in response to who he thinks he is, the circumstances that he finds himself in, and who God declares him to be. The phrase, interestingly, is the same phrase in the book of Ruth where they talk about Boaz. In the NIV, they talk about he's a man of standing. What this word, this phrase really means is somebody who's, yes, man of standing, man of courage. Here, it's mighty warrior. I think it's best to say something like man who's got it all together. He's got it all together. And the angel declares this, even though we see Gideon not doing this. This is important. God declares Gideon's identity before he had done anything to live it out. That's our first lesson from today's text. Number one, God knows the real you. God knows the real you. God's truth, the word, the Bible says that thy word is truth. It's not just true, meaning that it comports to what we see in reality around us, because it often doesn't, does it? Right? It often says things that we don't believe, because as we see the society around us, it doesn't make any sense. But God's word itself is true. It is faithful. It is, in other words, reality itself. I say this frequently. I don't know the last time I said it. I need to keep a chart of all of my sayings, but I'll tell you. People make fun of me for believing in God, that I'm a Christian. And when I recite things from the Bible or I speak a biblical concept, they say, you're just brainwashed. And I say, thank God. Thank God. We all need to be brainwashed. And I say that in the most positive sense possible. It's not that we're succumbing to some other body of falsity and that we're just living out of a lie. No, we're living out of the truth. And our mind is completely inundated with lies until pretty soon we don't know up from down, do we? We need to know the Lord's truth, and that is in the Bible. God's word is truth. God knows the way things really are. God's view of life is reality itself. Often my prayer for you is that they would see that you would see your lives the way God sees your lives. That you would see your own heart, your circumstances, the way God sees your heart and your circumstances. Not only does God know the way the things really are, but he knows the way things ought to be. He is morality. He is the canon, the standard for morality itself. When we read the Bible, we not only know how the world is supposed to be, or how it is, but how it's supposed to be, and how we are called to interact in it. Because God's truth is reality, this is our standard and our measuring stick for life. And because God knows reality, that means he knows the real you. The angel didn't come up and just say some wishful thinking. God didn't appear to him and just say, you know, one day you're going to be. He declared him in that moment, mighty warrior. God declares things about you in his scripture every single moment you open that book. Every time you receive the Lord's word to you and it says something like, fear not because you are more than a conqueror. When it says things like, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against invisible principalities and powers. That's all true. God declares things about you that you can't see because we, like I said, participate in the delusion. Now, he knows really you, not the identity that you assign to yourself or has been assigned to you by others. Elaine and I went out to eat last night, and I always... I like the people watch. It probably drives her nuts because she wants me to like focus on her and stuff. And No, I do. I love you. But I like the people watch. What can I say? And there was this kid, young man, walking down the street in the city, and he was wearing clothing that was interesting. Okay, um, There's nothing particularly interesting about it. It might have just been the collection, the colors, the type of stuff. It, just, it was not like a typical outfit of any gender, of any style, of any. It was just unusual in my eyes. Okay. And I could not help but think that this young man was wearing a costume. In seeking to be who he thought he really was, he wore whatever it was he was wearing to portray that identity. And for just a moment, I thought that God sees the real him. 
that God sees through all of those masks and those protective barriers that he might put up against them, against those who would be, I'm reading a lot into his life right now, but, but she, he could have been going to a costume party. I have no idea. But you know what I mean. You know what I mean. I sometimes get flack for not coming up and wearing a suit on the stage. Then when I do, I get flack for coming up and being too buttoned up for the stage. I just want to be me. God knows the real me. God knows the real you. So why don't we just live like that? It sounds so simple, but I assure you it's not easy because we've all been trying it our entire life. Yet we have wound up in places that we didn't want to be, thinking things we didn't want to think, and trusting in things other than God. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows your current situation. In its reality, in its intricacy, the sadness you feel, the anxiety, the fear, the anger, he knows that intimately, listen, better than you know it. So when it seems like God's not hearing you, you're praying again and again, it seems like you're distant from God and he can't possibly relate to the situation you're in, know that God does know because God knows everything better than you. Your past experiences, the traumas you've been in, God knew those. He was there. That's a hard saying. He was there. And he's with you now. And he'll be with you in your future struggles as well. Yet despite this, Gideon doubts what he's been told and ignores his God-given identity. Look at me in verse 13. So he just gets called a mighty warrior, and this is his response. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon said, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him. See, this is where we see the difference between the angel of the Lord and the Lord. You can't see it up here. I don't think so. No, uh, no, you can't. But in the scripture, when you look at the English Bible, the word Yahweh, that's the proper name of God, is all capital letters. Okay? When he refers to the angel of the Lord, sometimes it's a lowercase. So now it moves from the angel of the Lord to the Lord. This is how we see this, that this is God's alter ego here, okay? This is God's presence on earth. But now the Lord has abandoned us and has given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in this strength you have. I guess, again, a declaration of who Gideon is, despite all appearances, and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? That's a Hebrew, that's a way in Hebrew saying, go, I'm sending you. Am I not sending you? It, it's go. Parents get this, right? We ask a question, it's really a command. It's really a statement. Worst thing to do, kids, is answer the question. Don't answer. Am I not sending you? It's interesting that Gideon sees the consequences of Israel's sin as evidence of God's abandonment. This is, we make bad choices, we decide to go our own way, we sin against God, consequences, natural consequences happen. We should not be surprised. And when we suffer and we're in the pain of those consequences, we say God has abandoned us. But last week we talked about that God is actually right there. Those consequences are coming upon you because of God's presence, not because of God's abandonment. That we suffer the pain of our consequences as God's grace to us because he desires us to come back to him. God declares Gideon's strength and true identity and sends him on a mission. Pardon me, verse 15. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? I mean, that would be any of our statements, don't you think? Looking at the circumstances, he's hiding in a wine press with a little bit of wheat from the Midianites, and, this, and, and, the, and God just came up and said, you're going to save all of Israel. So he said, how can I save Israel? My clan's the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Manasseh, while it was a large area of, pop, you know, um, a tribal area, the, the clan was, in and of itself, was not a very robust or strong or politically important clan at all. So he's saying, I'm from Manasseh. And not only that, I'm the least in my family from Manasseh. Gideon looks at himself through the eyes of the flesh. He labels himself. Do you see that? I'm just a Manassite. I'm just a Abriezerite. And at that, I'm the littlest guy. He limits himself. So the second thing we need to see, like Gideon tried to do, is that the things of this world do not define you. The world does not define you. The world loves to put labels on people. We do it ourselves. We sort things, don't we? 
Like when we're trying to organize the closet, we'll put everything in one spot. This goes here, everything goes here. And we do that with people. We do that with ourselves. We assign a label to ourselves so that we can be put into a box, so that we can, as we'll see, find some comfort in the people around us. Our view of ourselves is skewed to the degree that we depart from who God says we are. And because we are fallible, we all have a skewed sense of self, and no one, no one is exempt. It's like we've forgotten who we really are. And every once in a while, we get a glimpse of the past. It's like the born identity, right? This guy gets fished out of the Mediterranean Sea, left for dead, but he's actually alive. He has something called retrograde amnesia. It means he can't remember anything prior to the event that, you know, the blow on his head or whatever. He can't remember anything. Suddenly, he starts speaking German and his hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. He has no idea. The truth is, is that he was really an operative for the CIA, and now the CIA is out to get him. They're chasing him. He has no idea that he's really somebody else. He thinks I'm just some guy. Turns out he's so much more. We think that we're just some guy, some gal. Who am I? I'm just someone from Elmhurst. I'm just someone from wherever. Just someone who's about to break the equipment. Who am I? I can't start this ministry. I can't talk to that person. I can't step out in faith and do that thing that God has created me to do? Yeah, we have so much more inside because God sees the real us. Not only does God see us, he's with us. Perhaps my favorite part is when Jason Bourne finds his passport. He opens it up and he sees, oh, I'm Jason Bourne. You know, not to stretch the metaphor too far, but the Bible is like our passport. It reveals to us who we really are. When we open it up and we read through its pages, it's speaking to you. God is using it to speak through to your heart, to your inner self, telling you who you are, telling you who you ought to be instead of who you think you are. In our spiritual amnesia, like Jason Bourne, we look for touch points to derive and define our identity. He spends his whole life, at least the whole movie, trying to figure out exactly who he is. And we do this too. We look at everything. We look at our circumstances, our income level, our health issues. Our mental health. I talk to a lot of people who don't feel right. They look to their feeling, they say something is wrong, and then they go on WebMD. Always dangerous. Then they come back and they say, I have X, Y, and Z. Well, why do you need that? I need a name for it. I need to label what it is that I'm feeling. I need to look at what it, my life and give an explanation. All the while, God is telling him or her exactly who they are and exactly what the problem is. We look at our family. I grew up in a bad family. Not me personally. I'm speaking hypothetically. I grew up in a bad family. I grew up in a great family. This is who I'm supposed to be. They expect so much out of me. Gideon points to his own family that he can't live out of his true identity and how God has called him. Others' expectations. Sometimes the people, in the, you'll have especially the oldest in the family, if a mom or dad is struggling really badly, that older person, the older child, takes over the role as a third parent and begins to wear a mask in taking charge and making sure things get done and that other people are taking care of their business, even though God may never have meant to be that. Maybe God never meant them or intended to be for them to be that way. They were living out of a mask. Or we live out of our feelings, our self-worth. We look at our sexual orientation, our temptations. There's so many. Our abilities, our perfectionism, the way we look, our inabilities, how we failed, our common sins, things like that. And we group ourselves with other people like us so that we can find the family that we lost, the spiritual family. The ideal that God created in the garden, that when our sin divided us, we split apart. So when we look at what Gideon says, it's very natural for us to say the same thing. Yet, we are not defined by the world. Verse 16. The Lord answered, I will be with you. And I will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. You see, the Lord's presence with him would make him successful so that he could achieve what seemed impossible. The Lord's present with you. When he's called you to do something, when somebody in the name of God comes and asks you to accomplish something 
and we receive that as coming from God himself, we can know that God will provide for us what we need to accomplish the mission that he has given us. But of course, Gideon being Gideon, and us being us, he asked for a sign. 17. Gideon replied, if I found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really, listen to this, that it's really you talking to me. I don't necessarily know what to make of this. In one instance, I could say, is he having this whole conversation in his head? And he doesn't know if it's really God of the Bible speaking to him. Probably not. Is it that they live in a polytheistic society and that they live in a world that's inundated with other gods? And the question would be, well, which God is it that I'm actually speaking to? I think that's probably it. I think Gideon is saying, prove to me that it's actually Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, the one who saved us out of Egypt. Verse 18, please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait till you return. (laughs) That is a profound statement. There are times we go off. We're in the wilderness. We're in the desert. We're doing other things. And God waits. God waits. He's patient and gracious. In a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about the golden or about the fleece, the fleece incident where Gideon again asks for another sign. And we're going to see that God, out of his grace, is patient. He's patient. Gideon, in the end, can't believe his ears. He cannot believe that this is Yahweh himself sending him on a mission, so he asked for evidence. He sort of allowed his self-concept to dictate his willingness to do what the Lord is asking. In other words, you can't be speaking to me. This task can't really be coming from God. If it were really God, he would know that I'm not up to it. So Gideon goes inside, verse 19, prepared a young goat. Now think about that. He prepares a goat, and he makes bread. This is how long he's hoping that this angel of the Lord will wait for him. But he's out there. He prepares this goat, and from an ephah of flour, he made bread without yeast, putting meat in a basket and broth in the pot. He brought them out and offered them to the angel of the Lord under the oak. When Gideon should have been conquering, he was cooking. That is us. That is us. We doubt who God says we are, We allow the world to dictate who we are. When God says, go and conquer, we end up cooking. Mundane activity. Is it stalling? I don't know. We probably all have different reasons for not doing what God has asked us to do. We waste time, maybe, hoping that God God will change his mind. Maybe he won't have me do it after all. Yet again, the Lord was patient. Verse 20, the angel of the Lord said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on the rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand, and fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. Gideon's means of asking for a sign seems a little bit unusual, don't you think? I mean, how would Gideon know that an offering like this would mean anything? But several times in the law, there are situations that are very similar to this, that something is prepared for as a sign and fire consumes that offering and that fire's consuming the offering is evidence that what has been said or what has been told is true that God is there that Yahweh is there verse 22 when Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord he exclaimed alas sovereign Lord I've seen the angel face to face in Exodus 33 20 it said whoever sees The Lord, God said, you cannot see my face. If you do, you will die. So Gideon realizes now that this is Yahweh, that this is the God of the Israelites. But God says to him, peace, verse 23, peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar there and called it the Lord is peace. And to this day, it stands in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. Gideon's first impulse when recognizing that it was God speaking to him was worship, and this should be ours as well. When faced with the reality of our identity of our identity in Christ, our, wor- our response should be worship. It should be worship. Gideon went from doubt to worship by a sign from the Lord. This impulse to worship God, to say and declare the things that God has done and has done for us should be in each and every one of us. In fact, I'm not going to put you on blast. I'm just going to give you a little bit of, okay? I put out a thing in Grace Connect, a, an announcement for testimonies. And I gave some categories for those testimonies. Raise your hand if you submitted a testimony. Exactly. 
Okay. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, I heard that. Checks in the mail. Okay. Just kidding. Who said that? I'm just I'm just giving you a hard time. I'm just giving you a hard time. If I put an open mic up here and I said, we get to brag on God. There should be a stampede in this church. There should be people pushing people over to declare the things, the amazing miracles that God has done in your life. Maybe he didn't part the Red Sea, maybe he didn't stop the sun, but he nevertheless has acted on your behalf in an amazing, mighty way. Revelation says that we defeat the beast by the word of blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. What we declare about God and what he has done for us has power. And because of that response, you guys have earned yourself an entire sermon series on witnessing, on testimony, the power of testimony, and how we make it way too hard. Way too hard. And we're going to see how God works through the stories in our own lives to change other people's hearts, mostly our own. Okay, that was my little plug for my next series. You've got to wait for the next three months to hear it, though. So, I want you today to consider your sign that what God has been telling you about you and your identity is true. I think there have been glimpses in your life that God has called you to do something. Maybe it's a passion, maybe it's a desire, maybe you've read something and it resonated deeply in your heart that God wants you to accomplish something, be something, think a certain way, and yet we have not done it. Perhaps you've given yourself excuses. It's too hard. That's not me. I don't think I can do that. I want you to know today that this sermon is your sign. That God is telling you it's okay to step out in faith. That he's declared to you beforehand who you are. And that you will accomplish all that he has said that you will accomplish. Consider the fact that you are really loved. That you're really capable. That you really are more than a conqueror and do that thing, whatever it might be, that God is asking you to do today. So if God knows the real you and the world does not define you, what then should we do? How then should we live? Third point for this morning, live like what God says about you is true. God knows who you are better than you do. The world does not define you, so live like it. So live like it. Part of the reason we struggle to obey is because God is asking us to function out of the real us and not out of the false us. God will see it, we see it throughout the scripture. God gives a mission to somebody, and they say, oh, I can't do that. There's no way I could do that. God sees who that person really is. God knew who Moses really was and what Moses was capable of doing. And so he called Moses to live like Moses is supposed to live. But Moses said, I'm slow in speech. I can't do this. You got the wrong guy. I killed some guy. You know, all these excuses. We see the same thing here. We see many times that we don't want to do what God has asked us to do because God is calling us in who we really are, not who we think we are. And to some degree, each of us are imposters. Because God knows us and we live differently. We live like somebody else. We act like somebody else. The sin in the world, the sin in our hearts and in society and Satan, they they blind us to our true identity. Now, in the main sanctuary, in each of the, hymn, the hymnals, there are mirrors like this. I want you to take them out. There might be some short ones over here. If not, pay attention and after the service. If you want one, make sure you get one. But there are mirrors. Check in the Bibles and then spread them out. On the one side is a mirrored finish. On the other side are biblical statements about who we are in Christ. I want you to look at the mirrored side. I want you to take a look at it. And if you hold things exceedingly still and you don't put any pressure on that mirror, you can just about see a third of your face. And it's pretty clear. We couldn't afford the full face. So you only get a third of the face. So if you hold it gently, you can see that, yeah, it's pretty clear, but it's not perfect. Now, I want you to imagine that on one corner, the sin in your heart is attached. On another corner, the sin in this world, the disease, the catastrophe, everything that makes life hard is attached to the other. Society gets a say, so they're pulling on one of the corners. 
and then Satan. And all of the spiritual beings behind what we see is pulling it together. And everyone wants a piece of you. So now look at that mirror and tug on that corner. Now try to look at your image in that mirror. Okay, it's not going to work. The harder we try to find out who we are, according to those four dimensions in the world, we are doomed to fail. We will never see who we really are. This concept of who we really are is actually a very biblical concept. We see that the day we die, that we stand before Jesus, not only will we see him as he is, but he will see us as we are. The delusion will be gone. Now, flip it over. Now imagine, same four concepts. Sin of the world pulling on one corner, our own sin in our heart pulling on the other, Satan pulling on another one, and society pulling on another one. Now twist that card. Does it make it any less hard to read the truth about what's on the back? No. No amount of tugging and pulling is going to change what God has declared about who you are in Jesus Christ. Now, when you start looking at yourself, <laughs> who am I really? Stop looking in the mirror. Start looking at what God has already declared you to be. God has declared you forgiven. God has declared you loved, shame-free. God has declared you powerful and willing and capable. So stop looking in the mirror. Now, there's actually two cards. One starts with, in Christ I'm able. And the other is, in Christ I'm secure. There's only two. Is there a third one? There's six. It's like trading cards. Afterwards, this is a good thing. Afterwards, you guys can get together and say, so which one do you have? Oh, I have this one. Which one do you have? And you can trade and no money, no money involved, not a marketplace, but six. Okay, that's interesting, trading cards. So do you see, you see, we begin looking at ourselves and try to understand who we are when God has already declared who it is that we are. Because of what Christ has done, because of what he did on the cross, we're able to step into our true identity and the blinders of this world are removed. But when we lose sight of who we are in Christ and begin stepping back into the delusion that anything other than God is the truth of our reality, we have loss. When we flip it from reading to looking, we lose. We lose. We become afraid to step out in faith because we believe, if I'm looking at myself, that's not a pretty picture. I can't possibly be up to the task that God's asking me. We might fail. What if we end up limiting ourselves and we end up selling ourselves short? It limits our faith achievements. We don't want to step out because we're looking at obstacles and abilities, lack of resources in our person instead of seeing who God is and what he's already declared because of what Christ has done. We rely on our own ability. As we look at us, we say, hmm, God's called me to this task. Do I look up to the task? No, I look pretty messed up. I'm pretty messed up. I can't do it. Instead, we focus on ourselves instead of what God says. And it limits our joy. We live according to who we see in the mirror instead of who God says we are. It's interesting about um, horses. My uncle has a farm. I sort of went there every summer for many years. He had different types of horses. And I didn't really know about all this, but certain horses obviously have different functions. You have a Clydesdale, a massive horse, absolutely massive, can pull thousands of pounds, right? And then you have a quarter horse that was really built to run fast, short sprints, quarter mile, no more. You have thoroughbreds and all these different ones. But you would never get on a Clydesdale and try to run 15 miles, no matter whatever commercial tells you. You're not going to run on a Clydesdale. And if you do, <laughs> you're going to kill the Clydesdale. It's not made for it. When we live in a fashion that's different than how God has made us, we lose joy and it's dangerous for us. We stay safe, fearing that if we thought or acted differently, we would only find trouble. And we limit God's presence with us. I'm blowing through some of these because there's a lot of them here. You know, it's like there's so many ways that we limit ourselves by focusing on ourselves instead of who we think we are, instead of who God says we are. We never try hard things. We never try new things because we lack the power looking at ourselves. We relegate ourselves to a solitary existence because we do not believe that God is with us. If I'm constantly focusing on myself, and let me put it this way, I can't look at myself and God at the same time. Okay? What we see is what our focus is on. If we're focusing on ourself and ourself alone and not seeing it in light of the God behind it, we're going to sell ourselves short. And really, it limits our vision of who God is. 
you realize that when God has called us to live a certain way, that when God has tasked us for a mission, whether that's something straight from the Bible about loving our neighbor or going or doing something, or if it's a very personal thing that God has set on our heart, and we don't do it, the testimony we're actually declaring is that we believe our God is weak and we believe that God is not faithful. When we fail to act or live out of our true identity, it says a lot more about who we believe God to be instead of who he actually is and who we really are in life. So real briefly, how do we live and operate out of our true identity? Like I said, we spend time focusing on God and not ourselves. We look at who God says we are in Christ and not who we believe we are. We look to his word. We constantly remind We brainwash ourselves, right? We brainwash ourselves. We repent of our failure to receive God's truth at face. There are ways that we doubt to try to get out of what God is asking us or to not be who God is telling us we already are. We need to repent of those things. And when we're faced with a challenge that seems impossible, we remind ourselves of our true identity. We're going to learn in a couple of weeks about how to, actually it's next week, no, week after, about how to doubt in faith. About how to doubt in faith. How is it that I can doubt what God is saying and still faithfully do what he's asking me to do? The first point is basically this. Put a stake in the ground. Put a stake in the ground. I don't know how many times I've said I've had to learn this in my own life. God's calling me to do something. I make it so it's impossible for me to not. And then I worry about what I have to do afterwards. Many of us will not put that stake in the ground because we know the implication is, is that we've drawn a line in the sand. Yet God calls us to do this. This is exactly what Gideon does when we, when we take a look at how he uh, dealt with this. So when you lose your way, when it seems like you're seeking your identity in the things of this world, comparing yourselves to others, conforming to other people's expectations, remember that God knows the real you. The things of this world do not define you, so we must live like what God says about us is true. May God grant you the grace to be comfortable in your own skin. Doesn't that sound awesome? Comfortable in your own skin? May you embrace God's truth about who you are in Christ. And may you, perhaps for the first time, or certainly more and more, live out of the real you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, your truth. You are truth. Your word is true. And we confess, Lord, there are times that we look to everything but your word to figure out who we are, what we should do, and how we should live. Lord. We confess, we ask for forgiveness, and we ask, Lord, that today might be a new day, that your mercy is new every day, that in this confession we would be restored and refreshed, Lord, to do exactly what it is you've called us to do out of exactly who we are, not who we think we are or others want us to be. We pray, Lord, that each day we would find our identity in you, that we would find our identity through what Christ has done. And because of his death on the cross, we're freed from the blinders. We, our eyes are open. We can see, Lord, who we really are and who you really are. We ask, Lord, that we would begin to live like it. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing this last song, you guys can feel free to stand or stay seated um, as you reflect on Adam's message. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Oh. No one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. 
show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Don't look at who you think you are. Focus on who God declares you to be. And as you go this week, may you live in that truth and may you find the joy, hope, and really the excitement of a life lived trusting in God. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for my family that you would give them strength and eyes to see the truth. Lord, I pray that you would open their eyes up to who they are, who you declare them to be, and I pray that they would live out of it. I thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us that you've not abandoned us, that you continue to walk with us. Show us more, Lord, each day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you guys.